Good morning and welcome to our Sunday worship service. Glad that you could join us today for our online service. And we have um, some great things lined up today to share with you. Um, just uh, some, some great music as usual. We have some things for the kids and uh, we're just so excited about that. And so for anyone who wants to be involved and send music or a poem or some sort of reading or artwork, we are so thrilled to be able to share that um, and have everyone contribute to these services. So please keep sending those in. We so enjoy it and I know everyone likes to see all the different faces. Um, thank you again to everyone who has been contributing for our food pantry. It is well stocked, it is great. So as of right now, um, we don't need any extra donations, um, but we'll be sure to let you know and update you as that changes, but certainly be letting people know that it is there. It is open 24 seven, so people can stop by at any time to get um, some extra groceries that they need. Um, no questions, just um, they can just grab it. So please spread the word about that to anyone that you know that might um, benefit from that. Um, we also have a session meeting later on today. So if you are a session member and elder watching this on Sunday morning, then know that at um, one o'clock you have a meeting coming up on Zoom. And um, for others, we just ask that you would pray for um, the church leadership as they continue to discuss questions about reopening, questions about safety going forward, um, and uh, thoughts about uh, where we're gonna be talking about our playground and um, ways that we can celebrate the 275th anniversary of the church next year. Just many things that um, continue to be worked upon um, by your church leadership. So we just ask that you um, pray for us and uh, pray for the elders um, as we go about God's work. Um, so we're going to be, like I said, uh, some fun things today um, in this service, but most of all, we are here um, to worship God together. And all of these different elements of the worship, our prayer is that it would draw you into worship. It would draw you into awe of God, our creator, our Lord, our savior. So let us now begin this time with a prayer. So I invite you to pray, to bow your heads and uh, join your hearts with mine in prayer. God of justice, in your wisdom, you create all people in your image without exception. Through your goodness, open our eyes to see the dignity, beauty, and worth of every human being. Open our minds to understand that all your children are brothers and sisters in the same human family. Open our hearts to repent of racist attitudes, behaviors, and speech which demean others. Open our ears to hear the cries of those wounded by racial discrimination and their passionate appeals for change. Strengthen our resolve to make amends for past injustices and to right the wrongs of history. And fill us with courage that we might seek to heal wounds, build bridges, forgive and be forgiven, and establish peace and equality for all in our communities. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm excited to share this next um, piece with you that um, Calvin has been working hard on. And this is a, a special thing for the kids, but I think people of all ages are going to really enjoy it. There was once a man who didn't have any friends. None. Do you have any friends? Well, of course you do, but not Zacchaeus. Poor Zacchaeus didn't have any you're probably wondering why. Was it because he was so short? That's not a reason not to like someone. Was it because he had a name that was hard to say? Well, neither is that. Even though he was short and he did have a funny name, that wasn't it. No, people didn't like Zacchaeus because he stole their money. Zacchaeus collected taxes. Taxes were what people had to pay the king. But Zacchaeus took more than he was supposed to and kept the extra money for himself and made himself rich. 
Everyone knew what he was up to, and it made them cross and grumpy. They didn't like Zacchaeus one bit. So they made sure he knew it by doing things like avoiding him and walking on the opposite side of the street and pretending not to see him and whispering things like, there's that nobody who thinks he's a somebody loud enough so he could hear. Anyway, one day, a huge crowd gathered by the road. Jesus was coming to their town and everyone wanted to see him. Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus too, but everyone was too tall. He tried jumping up and down, but that didn't work. He couldn't see a thing. Luckily, Zacchaeus had a good idea. I'll climb that sycamore tree, he said. So he did. He was surprisingly good at climbing trees for a man who was so unusually short that he had to take a flying leap just to get into his chair in the morning. From the tree, Zacchaeus had the perfect view all the way down the road. Another minute and suddenly Jesus was at the tree. He stopped and looked up. Zacchaeus saw Jesus and Jesus saw Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, Jesus said. I'd like to come over to your house. Zacchaeus almost fell out of the tree. Come over to his house? No one ever wanted to come anywhere near his house, let alone inside it. The people saw this, and needless to say, it made them even crosser and grumpier than usual. They mumbled and murmured and muttered, Why is Jesus being kind to that big sinner? Doesn't Jesus know about him? Zacchaeus scrambled down and took Jesus to his house. He was in a hurry because he didn't want Jesus to change his mind. Perhaps Jesus hadn't heard about him. Perhaps Jesus didn't know about how he had been stealing and how no one liked him and how he didn't have any friends. But Jesus knew. He knew all about Zacchaeus and the stealing and everything. And he still loved him. Zacchaeus was ashamed. Lord, he said, turning pale, what I've done is wrong. But now I want to do the right thing. I will give the money back to everyone, four times what I stole. And that's just what he did. Jesus smiled. My friend, he said, today God has rescued you. Jesus loved Zacchaeus when nobody else did. He was Zacchaeus' friend even when no one else was because Jesus was showing people what God's love was like. His wonderful, never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. Hey everybody, I'm in the car with the family. There's Pastor Casey and Calvin, he's seat belted. He's just leaning forward. Oh, there's another one back there. All right, um, we are on our way to go do some Bible deliveries. Um, normally this is something that we would do during a Sunday morning service with everyone gathered together. But um, since we can't do that, it was still really important to us to get these Bibles out to our kids, to our elementary kids. And um, it would have been something we did this spring. And so we're doing it now. And so we're heading on out. We're going to deliver a Bible to one of our students and pray for them. And um, in the front of each Bible, it has their name, so they know that like this is theirs. This is theirs to treasure and to keep and to read. And in the front, we wrote uh, the Bible verse, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And what a reminder for all of us, because it is such a treasure that we have, and it is such a rich book of, of not just wisdom and history, but of God's word to us and his promises to us and it is alive and it is active and sharper than any double-edged sword and so we get to read it we get to treasure it and let it dwell in us so um, we're excited to do these deliveries Bible for you. This Bible is just like the 
Bibles that we have. It has all the same word. Read it. And I know that there's going to be things in here that you don't understand, but you can ask your mom or dad, or you can ask one of your pastors. <laughs> Those are the same people. Okay, mom. <laughs> okay. We're going to be reading from Acts chapter 18 today from uh, the ESV, just the first part of it, and uh, starting in verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, uh, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. When he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogues every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with, with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or a vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it's a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal, and they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello, we're going to sing the first and last verse of Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. Hello, my name is Paul, and I am a tent maker, and more importantly, I am a, an apostle, a disciple of Jesus Christ, and I believe that Jesus Christ is 
our Lord. He is the Son of God. He was brought to this earth to show us the way to the Lord. If we believe in him, we may repent and turn towards God. And I'm here to tell you that good news. Yes, indeed. And I pray that you'll take this, the news that the prophets pointed to, saying that Jesus was the way and that you will follow him. And if you become angry and abusive to me, why then I wash my hands and may your blood be on your heads. Oh, yes. In fact, I'm so upset I'm going to lie down for a little bit. Sleeping. Paul, do not be afraid. Keep up speaking and do not be silent for I am with you and no one is going to attack you and harm you because I have many people in the city. Oh, that's good news. What a relief. I don't have to remain silent. The Lord will protect me. Oh, yes, I will stay here and teach for another year and a half. Goodbye. All right. We're going to move through this section of Acts 18 pretty quickly uh, before hanging out right at the end of it. Uh, but let's get some of the setting out of the way at the start. Uh, we are in Corinth, uh, still in Macedonia, kind of the modern-day Greece uh, area, moving along from Berea, Thessalonica that we've seen in the last couple of weeks, and Athens. So the travels of Paul and his company continue. But here, he's going to stay a good deal longer than he's been at these other cities and towns. And why? Well, we'll get to that later as the story unfolds. When Paul arrives, there's pl plenty of the same that goes on here as it does in those other areas. You know, you pull into town, you check out the local hot spots, coffee shops, that sort of thing. Really, for Paul, it's, it, he's going to the synagogue, uh, opening up the text, preaching to the Jews and Gentiles about how the plan of God reaches to us in Jesus, that the Old Testament texts point us to Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah. And he's doing this every Sabbath. And meanwhile, his friends uh, Silas and Timothy catch up with him. Uh, he meets some new friends, Priscilla and Aquila, who are fellow tent makers, but we'll hear more of them later on another Sunday. It's another cliffhanger, right? Uh, but we get to something different then. Things go differently in Corinth. Uh, the leaders in the synagogue revile and oppose him, and that's, that's more of the same. But rather than being run out of the synagogues at this point, Paul himself says, fine. Fine then. Here's the quote. Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. I mean, the idea is Paul in his own power can't convert anyone, can't force anyone to change their minds. He's done his part to proclaim the good news. And then he says, from now on, I'm out of here. I'm going to the Gentiles. And he does. He goes, he goes next door to a new believer who lives right by the synagogue. And some people do follow, and they believed from the Jewish community, including the leader of the synagogue, Crispus. And it brings up a hard question. The way he, he phrases this and makes this abrupt turn leaving the synagogue behind, how do we know when we should leave situations that are problematic, antagonistic, um, that are opposing things that we're doing. You know, there's a, a place in the Gospels where Jesus says that we shouldn't cast pearls before swine. I mean, how are we supposed to know when and where we should share the good news? Really, when should we know about throwing in the towel? And I don't really have an easy answer on this one. It doesn't, does not seem here in Acts that the answer is, before we even try. Paul has already been preaching on many occasions uh, in the synagogues. For weeks there, he's, he's there sharing with them before he leaves. So I don't think God requires us to necessarily stay in one place forever to keep sharing the same words to the same people who may never listen. Uh, but God sometimes may call us to preach in places that we will not be, be heard. I mean, there are people in the Bible who are given the work of just that. They are the prophets. They didn't always have a word of, of God that causes people to turn and receive it. They just announced the words and kept being ignored. 
So I don't know when we should do it. And sometimes God calls us to places that are fruitful. Other times we are just called to be faithful. At least take comfort knowing, remembering that we're not in charge of the results. Uh, be attentive to God, to his leading, to his direction, to his call, and be faithful to it. We may be called to stay or to go, but the results are ultimately up to him. And so Paul here does, does leave, but he doesn't actually hightail it out of Corinth. In fact, now getting back to why Paul is here for all of those 18 months, the year and a half, he is explicitly told by God to, to stick around. Uh, God says, he sends him a word of this vision. He's told to keep speaking. Do not be silent. And God promises that he will keep Paul safe. And that, that promise leads us directly to the next paragraph in this text. And, and it perhaps takes away a bit of the tension when the crowds come clamoring for Paul, when he is uh, taken to the tribunal at the front of a mob of people in this united attack. We should realize the connections and that God had just promised them. And we should then understand, because of what we just read, we should know Paul, Paul will be fine this time around because he's protected. God has promised him. And so what does happen at the tribunal? To kind of quickly go through this, the, the accusation is that Paul is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. Paul almost gets to respond to this accusation in his defense, but he is, he's stopped. Paul doesn't even have to speak. Gallio, who's the, the kind of the government official here, Gallio jumps in to say, I don't care. Uh, this is about your laws and your names and your words. I mean, why are you here? This united attack brings Paul right before him and he just stops them and says, what's your point? It'd be like if you wanted to take your neighbor to you know, people's court, some daytime Judge Judy show to really get back at them. And you've got all your papers organized. You're so serious about this. And you bring it to the studio. And the producer stops you right there and says, where, where do you think you're going? <laughs> you're not going on our TV show. No one cares. You have nothing of interest. It would be deflating at least. And for this group of people who are taking Paul to court, it would probably be humiliating for them. So after this whole attack, united attack on Paul, after it breaks down before Gallio, we are only then given the name of the ruler of the synagogue, a man named Sosthenes. He's the leader of the synagogue. Perhaps he took over after Crispus left with Paul to follow Jesus. Under him, they made this, this attack to make trouble for Paul, but it ends up being trouble for them because the proconsul Gallio doesn't care. It's an embarrassment. They lose clout before the Roman officials. It's trouble, and the people are mad. I mean, they've been stirred up, right? And so their energy has to go somewhere, and it turns to Sosthenes. You know, you fool, you made us a mockery. It says that they seized him, and they beat Sosthenes, adding it was done in front of Gallio. I, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe they're trying to appease the court to say, sorry for wasting your time. We will now beat the leader of our people to just make amends. Uh, letting that person know it won't happen again. I don't know, but, it, but Gallio, again, doesn't care. Doesn't care at all. And it seems the leaders of the synagogue don't care either now for Sosthenes. He has been rejected before Gallio, and he's rejected by his own people. And so what comes, what comes next for him? What do you do if someone has wronged you or let you down or failed you. If you have a chance to act or react against this person, what do you do? You know, recently, I'm sure if you've read the news, uh, you'll see a lot of the protests and how uh, there have been occasional outbursts of violence in different places. Uh, there were some uh, militia, some white nationalists in California that opened fire. Uh, there have been some stores looted and fires set in some cities from protesters. There's been pro police brutality and overreactions. In the midst of this, uh, there was one incident, and this is out in London. And the supporters protesting treatment of, uh, the, the people who are protesting the treatment of 
of black people were confronted by others, kind of on the far right, who were white supremacists here. And in the midst of this, there's also the police. And the protesters from the right were kind of agitating, and later it's reported that you know, about 100 of them were arrested for vandalism and attacks of the police. And this is a situation that's just like a powder keg. Frustration and anger on every side. People in the Black Lives Matter a group feeling targeted for generations and not being protected equally under the law. And, and they're out there to bring attention. And when they face pressure from police and from counter protesters, the pressure, it, it builds and it builds. And as we know, people, especially when they are in big groups, take on that mob mentality and mobs do stupid stuff. I mean, we all do. And altercations erupted. And in the midst of this, a black man that was there to support Black Lives Matter saw a white man who had come to protest against him. Saw him hurt and on the ground, surrounded by people full of anger. And he bent down, and he threw this man up on his shoulder, and he carried him out to safety. This guy's name was uh, Patrick Hutchison, and he was interviewed about this. And he said that he knew the other guy was probably there to oppose what Hutchison himself was doing, but that didn't matter. He needed to get him out of there for the safety of this man and really for the safety also of the whole environment, the whole situation there. You know, when, there, when there's a chance for retribution, when someone has wronged you or stood up uh, against what you value, when you as a people have been treated unfairly, when you have been victimized, when you have a chance then to turn it around, well, there is an opportunity to either continue the cycle, to kick a man when he is down, or even just do nothing and leave that guy hurt and in danger. Or when you have a chance to return to someone what you have suffered, you also have the opportunity to do something extraordinary, to offer grace and mercy, to pick him up and carry him out on your shoulders. Now, we don't know what happened to Sosthenes. We don't know. Sitting there, uh, bruised and beaten outside the courthouse, having led this charge against Paul and the church, now he's rejected and attacked by his own people, what comes next? There's reason, though. We don't know, but there's reason to think that Paul came to him. Maybe, maybe not right then, but maybe. Paul had been uh, opposed and reviled in Corinth just like everywhere else. He's just trying to open their eyes to see the good news of Jesus. And, and people lie about him. People beat him. They accuse him of wrongdoings. They lie about him. Uh, uh, they toss him out of town, and he's tired of it, with good reason. And in Corinth, he marches out to continue his work with the Gentiles. And so when he finds Sosthenes, the one who led the united attack against him, and realize, realize that when they led this attack against Paul, they don't know. You never, you never know what's going to happen when you get a mob together. You bring Paul before the authorities and before a group calling for his punishment, you don't have control anymore. Sosthenes could have been leading Paul to execution. So Paul finds Sosthenes, his rival and opponent, now weak and rejected and beaten. And what does he do? What could he do? There is reason to think that Paul offered him a hand offered him the gospel. When Paul writes a letter to the Corinthian church, check this out here for yourself. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, first verse, he begins by saying, who is writing? That's how he starts his letters. He says, I, Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. There's a man named Sosthenes, a brother who is with Paul now, who together they are sending this letter to the people, the church in that city, in Corinth. And we don't, we don't know, is this the same guy? We're not sure. But this is the kind of thing that Paul is doing. Paul himself had been a, a part of the Jewish church, and then he was turned on 
by his own people. He had a story to connect with the experience of Sosthenes. And, and perhaps to this guy who had hated Paul, Paul does not return the favor, but returns with grace and mercy. He writes in that letter to Corinthians, to the Corinthian church in Corinth, when reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. And that echoes Jesus himself who says, I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who abuse you. I mean, what, what Paul's ministry is about is about Jesus. Seeing times when we can get back at someone, seeing those times as opportunities for grace and mercy is what Paul's about because it's what Jesus is about. Look, we don't know what happened with Sosthenes of Acts 18 and if he is the Sosthenes of 1 Corinthians 1. I don't know how popular of a name that was. But there are people that we do know about in Scripture. We know about Zacchaeus. We heard about him already this morning. Uh, A man who defrauded his fellow Jews on behalf of Rome and on behalf of himself, becoming very rich at their expense as he collected taxes over and above what the requirement was. Zacchaeus was surely hated for it. I mean, read the Gospels. You'll pick up this notion of sinners and tax collectors as being synonymous, as being closely associated. He is hated. He's pushed to the outside, to the edges. And if you had the opportunity to get back at Zacchaeus, you'd do it. Right? But Jesus. But Jesus, he sees Zacchaeus. He calls to him by name, and he says, I'm going to your house. Jesus, he crossed the line that others had set up. How could you go eat with Zacchaeus? He is a sinner. We don't treat him that way. He doesn't deserve that. Of all people, he doesn't deserve it. But Jesus, but Jesus doesn't give this guy what he deserves when he treats Zacchaeus better. He treats him better than he has treated others, and it changes Zacchaeus. He responds to it, and Zacchaeus says, I'm going to now do the same. He's going to make things right. And note, note, he doesn't say uh, that I'm going to, you know, I'm going to fix those accounting errors. Gosh, I'm so sorry. I'm so embarrassed. I'm going to, I'm going to fix it. Don't worry. Just what it should have been. I'll put it back to that. No, he, he doesn't really repay what he owes. It's not about making exact restitution. Even Stevens. No. He says, I will give half of what I own to the poor, and if I defrauded someone, I will restore it fourfold. This is not about what people deserve. Instead, he goes over the top, above and beyond. I mean, think about it for a bit. If you've ever been a part of something, um, if you've ever harmed somebody and are kind of indebted to that, to, to make things right, is our instinct just to make things even? You know, we're going to just do what the courts decide uh, is just. We're to really make it right to follow Jesus and to follow Zacchaeus. Do we look to do more? For him, it's about grace and mercy. To those he took from, those who were likely his enemies, he goes above and beyond. He gives back what, uh, more than what was taken. For he was taken with Jesus, with his grace and mercy, so he wants to share. All right, one, one final example as we close up. Uh, we may not know the full story of Sosthenes, but we do know of many in Scripture like Zacchaeus, and we know the story of you and me. In Romans 5, we are told that, that we're sinners. We're enemies of God. We are against God. We've sinned. And, and remember, as the psalmist David tells us, that when we sin, it's against God. God suffers our sins. And so what do we deserve? When God decided to dole out just punishment for all of our rebellions, what does he do? 
Having endured our sins for countless generations, did God send his son to fight back? To make war? To wipe us out? No, Romans 5 tells us that while we were still sinners, while we were enemies, Christ died for us. Even though we had it coming, we deserve a just penalty of death and separation from our good God. God came and he offers us his hand. He offers us his gospel. The good news that he would go to the cross for us and that his hands would be pierced for us so we can receive grace and mercy. Receive none of the ultimate punishment that we deserve and receive absolutely more of God's love than we could ever earn. In Acts Paul is about this because he's about Jesus. It's why he came. And so, can we be all about it too? We have chances all of the time, all the time, to weigh out the options and think about how we should react. Does someone deserve my my good favor? Does someone deserve my forgiveness? Do some people deserve to be helped? Gosh, our, our country is so polarized. People are are just mean to people, people who disagree. I mean, and do you have some justified reason to be mean? Sure, we can go with karma. Just keep those scales balanced. Just what is fair. Just what we deem to be enough to make things fair and, and just. We can dole out punishments in whatever form when we are wronged. When someone's driving poorly in front of me and deserving of my horn, you know, someone passes over you at work and you get back. Someone says something unkind to your face or behind your back. I don't know, maybe you're in some sort of true Hatfield-McCoy situation right now. I don't know. But you have that choice. To repay evil with evil or to see these specialized, specific, intense times to see these things as enormous opportunities for the gospel, for grace and mercy. To hold back the punishments that someone may deserve and to give them what they do not deserve. Friends, we have not received what was coming to us. We do not get the sentence that we deserve. Jesus steps in to take it from us. And we were not even close to earning the blessings that we receive in Jesus. So now when we see a Sothenes, someone who has set himself against us down in a ditch, do we celebrate the defeat of an enemy? Or will we offer them a hand? Amen. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great Thy faithful
Monday we talked about something we miss from our Sunday services and that's passing the peace, that time to go around and uh, share the peace of Christ and see people shake hands and maybe you've got somebody in the family room with you. So maybe you can pause and get up and, and shake hands and say peace of Christ be with you. Uh, but let's, let's at least affirm that truth of what brings peace to us in Jesus Christ. Uh, I'll have words up on the screen. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and also with you. You know, the thinking about this uh, passing the peace, peace and how it might be hard to do without a sanctuary, I was actually reminded that what we do in a sanctuary is really practice what we should be doing in the world. Worship should form and change us. And when you look at the way that these services are ordered, even for something like passing the peace, some of the books will say, at this point, what you do is, to quote, the people may exchange with one another by words and gestures, signs of peace and reconciliation. And yeah, we can do that in the sanctuary, but, but we can absolutely, and we need to do that in the world to bring out grace and peace, or grace and mercy, and show the, the peace of God that comes through Jesus Christ. So go as a people forgiven and let us forgive. And as a people given peace, may we exchange in word or gesture peace and reconciliation with the world around us. Now receive this benediction from Romans 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Amen.